Mr. Mark Sargent. There are a couple reasons why I think I'm kind of uniquely positioned to speak here today. The first of which is that I survived the Connecticut family court system, but I'm not in it. I'm not stuck in it. And I got out of it in the worst of possible ways, which is that my ex-wife died. And as a result of that, I'm not in the Connecticut family court system, and I don't have to worry about any kind of consequence if I speak out against the judges who are in it or uh, some of the people who are involved in it. Um, and I'm also, I think, well positioned to speak because I am a lawyer. I actually, when I graduated from law school, I clerked for the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Connecticut, or Eastern District of Pennsylvania. So I, I've worked in the judicial system, and I know how judges are supposed to work. I got to meet, I worked with a judge every day during that job. I got an understanding of how uh, judges work and think, and how a judicial system is supposed to operate. I'm, I actually remain incredibly impressed with the United States federal judiciary. And that's a big part of my concern, is that there's a real contrast in my mind between how the federal judiciary works and how the judiciary of the state of Connecticut works. And a lot of what I have to say and do, um, my perspective is motivated by that distinction. Um, I don't have any financial interest in any of this. I, <laughs> I don't have any interest in representing any of you in family court. After you hear what I have to say, you'll understand why I shouldn't be doing that. Um, and another nice thing about me is that my practice isn't based in family court, and that's very different than, or it isn't based in the Connecticut court system at all, really, and that's different than most of the other lawyers who practice law in Connecticut. So, for example, if I'm representing a, a parent or a special education child in a dispute with a school district, initially the dispute happens with the school district and their attorneys, and then to the extent we can't resolve something, there's an administrative process. We have what we call a special education due process hearing. Uh, which is an administrative process that the State Department of Education kind of runs. They appoint a hearing officer. And then to the extent that I don't get the right outcome in that proceeding uh, or the school district appeals, you can appeal to the United States uh, District Court for the District of Connecticut. So for the most part, my practice doesn't touch the Connecticut court system. And that's really important because there are a whole bunch of things about Connecticut's legal system that are very different than other states. And I think probably aren't obvious to people. The first of which is we're a really small state. And what that means is there's a pretty decent probability that if you're a lawyer that's, and you're litigating in the Connecticut state court system, sooner or later you're going to run into any given judge. I mean, if you practice for long enough, sooner or later it, it's going to happen. And I think that makes lawyers really reluctant to speak out when they have concerns about judges. Uh, and I will tell you one odd thing, when I started speaking out about family court reform, an enormous number of lawyers who've had nothing to do with family court have come to me and said, that they are really proud of me and that what I'm doing is really necessary, but it goes kind of unspoken that there's no possible way that they could do that, right? So I have kind of a privilege, if you will, in the sense that I'm not involved in it. Um, and I will tell you that my view of the Connecticut family court system is that it's absolutely horrific. And the way I will present that is I will tell you some of my personal experiences in the Connecticut family court system. And because of my unique circumstances, I think my divorce was very different than other people's divorces, okay? So in contrast to a lot of people who have no access to their children, as a practical matter, I had access to my kids 24-7. You know, I was the person who had all the parenting time. Relatively um, early in the process, as things go, I had sole legal custody of my children, okay? Um, and so that makes me pretty different. So I was kind of the opposite of the alienated parent. Um, and then after I tell you my personal experience, uh, then I will ex share with you some other experiences that I have come across uh, in the Connecticut family court system. And then I hope to step back and build what I call an economic model that explains what's going on. So in the preview, you may have heard that I, as I tell my children, a grad school dropout because I was a JD PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania. And while I finished law school, I didn't finish the PhD program. I did all the coursework. I got a master's degree. I, I passed for the uh, preliminary exams, I passed the field exams, but I was practicing law at a very prestigious law firm in Manhattan after that. I was making a lot of money and I frankly enjoyed that. Um, and as a result, I never finished the PhD program. I do, however, view myself very much as an economist. I tend to step back and say, okay, what are people's economic incentives in a specific situation and how does that explain the world? And I think that that can shed some insight into what's going on in the Connecticut family law system and why it's so difficult to fix, okay? So at the beginning, my personal experience, and I'm pretty open about my divorce, um, and, and so you should feel free to ask me more questions about it. I do try and keep my kids out of it. Uh, but the short of it is my, my divorce involved the following. 
It involved uh, two guardian ad litems for my children, including one whom I managed to get dismissed for cause. And that's an impossible achievement in the Connecticut family court system. I think that I'm the first litigant to ever have his guardian ad litem dismissed for cause. To my knowledge, I think I'm still the only uh, litigant to have his guardian ad litem dismissed for cause. Um, it's basically impossible to do because you'll find out you have no legal standing to even ask that your guardian ad litem to be dismissed. And then she has absolute, complete legal immunity from anything she does. But I didn't do that until after she had billed me more than $100,000. And I want to be absolutely clear, at the time that I was divorced, my ex-wife was on long-term disability for mental health reasons, and I was a stay-at-home dad. Okay, I had left an investment banking job on Wall Street, and I was subject to a non-compete, so I was taking care of the kids uh, when my wife's disability became, uh, my, my, my wife's illness became disabling, and she was on disability. She was for all the rest of that, okay? Um, the, the guardian ad, one of the two guardian ad items, the first of the two guardian ad items who was appointed for my kids, uh, in turn, managed to, to get appointed for her uh, a lawyer to represent her. And that came about when I started to challenge the acts of the guardian ad litem and her integrity and said, this is ridiculous. You know, what you're doing has nothing to do with the best interest of my children. Um, you're violating my rights. You're violating my children's rights. Uh, I'm not, and you're just stealing money from me. You're just stealing huge amounts of money from me. And I, I won't have any of that. I'm, I'm going to get rid of you. And I'm, I'm kind of done dealing with you. But then at that point, she went to the judge and asked the judge to appoint a lawyer to represent her at my expense. Now, in Connecticut, first of all, the guardian ad litem had no legal authority to even make a motion. Do you understand? One of the huge problems with guardian ad litems in general is that their legal role is completely undefined. It's completely undescribed. So basically, they can do whatever they want, and it's whatever they get away with. As a lawyer, I knew that she wasn't a party to the proceeding. She hadn't filed a motion to intervene. I kind of thought she wasn't a witness, because while she was speaking in court all the time, she wasn't under oath. Um, she wasn't being asked questions. The rules of evidence didn't seem to apply to her. The vast majority of what she said was inadmissible. It was either hearsay or worse. So I didn't really know what, what the guardian ad litem was. And when a guardian ad litem was first appointed for my kids, I thought it was a great idea. While the lawyer had no experience with the family law system, and certainly not in Connecticut, and I thought, wow, isn't it really nice the state of Connecticut cares enough about my kids that they appoint uh, someone to represent the best interest of my kids? I will tell you the bell did go off where I kept thinking, you know what, as a constitutional matter, I'm the parents, and what parents do as a constitutional matter is they have a constitutional right to the care, custody, and control of their children. That just does. And in fact, it's really, really difficult for a state to take away the, right, the parents' rights to the care, custody, and control of their children. So nonetheless, I, I didn't object when the guardian ad litem was appointed initially, but certainly over time, Long after all the lawyers had been fired, you know, my ex-wife had fired hers and rotated through several ones, I eventually realized that mine were in it for their own self-interest and they weren't going to help me. And it struck me I could figure out this family law stuff. If I could figure out graduate economics at an Ivy League institution, I could certainly figure out how to practice family law in Connecticut. So I basically represented myself for uh, a, a lot of what followed. At certain times, I did hire uh, other counsel. I was pretty careful to not hire a family lawyer I would instead hire a civil rights lawyer, which is a constitutional lawyer. And I, I would suggest to you that's really what you need if you're going to survive in family court in Connecticut. So in terms of my personal divorce and what I experienced, there was a guardian ad litem who was appointed. She did a whole bunch of things I thought were completely ridiculous, unrelated to anything to do with my children. She thought her appointment was perpetual. She at one point told me that she would be in my life until my daughter turned 18. At the start of my divorce, my children were four, six, and uh, eight. So my daughter was four years old. Um, she would tell me I had to bring the kids to her office, at which point she would charge me $300, and I said no. She would tell me that I had to leave the kids alone with her, and I said absolutely not. I'm their parent. I'm under no circumstances is the state of Connecticut going to take away my right to determine with whom my children are left alone. Um, and so things got to be pretty testy pretty quickly. And so I really expected, when I started to raise concerns about the acts of my guardian ad litem, I really expected, having worked in the federal judiciary, okay, where there's a, a huge amount of ethical concern, I really expected to be supported by the judicial branch. I expected someone to come up to me and say, oh my gosh, I absolutely cannot believe that someone tried to use a judicial appointment in our state to take money from you 
I cannot believe that that happened. I cannot believe that someone suggested that you leave your child alone with him or her. I cannot believe that someone suggested that you had to bring your child to some private, for-profit individual. I cannot believe that all these things were happening. When I started as a judicial clerk for the United States District Court, one of the first things that happens is that the judge for whom I work sat me down and said, you are now a member of the federal judiciary of the United States of America. And what we do is we protect people's rights and we protect uh, the Constitution of the United States. And it was one of those wow moments, okay? The guy was a Nixon appointee, he was old as the hills, uh, had the, the wisdom of Solomon. And it was a wow moment. And then you later get that speech when you go through the training process from basically the, the administrative uh, people who are responsible for the court system. And that is what I expected when I first started to express concerns about corruption in the family court system. That is not what I got. Instead, what I got was this thought that I was somehow a um, disgruntled litigant. And I always think of a, there's a, a far side cartoon I once saw that has a guy in a suit and tie in the corner. And at the bottom it says, James was, well, not disgruntled, James was far from gruntled. And, and that's the way I feel, okay? I, I think that I'm not a disgruntled litigant, but I'm far from gruntled. I have a lot of legitimate concerns about what happens in the family court system. So I started raising concerns about um, my guardian ad litem, and I was uniquely positioned to do that. The vast majority of you, if you try and do that in your matter, the guardian ad litem is going to do the rational thing, which is award the kids to the other parent, right? <laughs> That's the profit maximizing strategy for the guardian ad litem is, is to do that. But again, my divorce was unique at that point in time. There was no possible way that that was going to happen because of my wife's situation. So I felt much more empowered to speak out. I will say at that point, the guardian ad litem pulled something of a trump card that I hadn't seen coming. She announced that she could see the need for foster, foster care for my children. And um, mm -hmm. that did, I will admit, that put the fear of God in me for a minute. But then I did the lawyerly thing and stepped back and said, okay, what do you do? Well, I mean, the answer was I went to the, the, the parents for whom I um, teach their kids Sunday school, for the, the parents who were in Boy Scouts, for whom I was the assistant troop leader. I went to the, um, the parents for whom I had taught their children, I had coached their children uh, kindergarten Little League. I went to my neighbors. I went to my kids' therapists. Uh, I went to everybody else and said, can you see any reason why my children should be in foster care? And they all said, absolutely not. And in some cases, I got those things in writing. And then I did what any good lawyer would do. I called the office of the chief state's attorney. And I think a lot of you, I think, have reached out to criminal law enforcement people. I do think there's an enormous amount of criminal activity in Connecticut's family court system. I really do believe that. I think a lot of... And, and to be clear to you, I think it involves the judges. And I think people are looking at this the wrong way. And I think that the fact that it involves the judges is what gives people pause, okay? So for example, if someone broke into your, your house and stole um, your couch, the way we would describe that is, someone broke into my house and stole my couch. They didn't buy my couch. There wasn't a voluntary exchange. I didn't agree to sell them the couch. They didn't leave me any money or any other consideration. Now let's say instead, a, a, a judge says to someone, I order you, or I give you the right to, break into Mark's house and steal his couch. Then if someone breaks into my house, and that guy breaks into my house and he steals my couch, the way I would describe that is, my couch has been stolen. But now I have a different crime. I have a much more serious crime because I have a crime that involves a judge. And that's my way of looking at it. So if someone breaks into your bank account and takes a huge amount of money from you, okay, um, I would say they've stolen and it gives you nothing in value and it wasn't part of a voluntary exchange. The way I would describe that is someone has stolen a huge amount of money from you. If they're doing it pursuant to a judicial order, I would say we have a huge problem because now we have a major crime involving a judge. Okay. And I, again, I have kind of a skill set that may be different than most people, and it struck me that a lot of other people had probably been to the prosecutors, but they probably hadn't presented things the right way. I know that in general, um, it, it helps sometimes to do other people's work for them, so I went through the statute book, picked the different crimes I thought may have been relevant. I went and read the jury instructions for those crimes, because it has the element of each crime in it, and I, in my mind, created the evidence that proved the element of each crime. Okay. The short of it is I got a lot more traction, I think, with the prosecutors than most of you have probably gotten. 
okay? And when I got there, they were already aware of certain people and certain names. So I got some attention from them, and, and hopefully I'll come back to that in, in a minute. So I, I was in front of the judge, and the judge kept protecting the guardian ad litem. And I, at first, was completely shocked by this. I'm thinking, this is crazy. I'm the person who's being abused, and I'm being abused by a court appointee. And this is just nuts. Why is the judge you know, defending her rather than me? And the judge started to do, in my mind, were outrageous things. When I would um, appeal, once I got good at appealing, I really encourage you, you need to be good at appealing. In Connecticut, normally when you appeal a ruling, it stays the ruling, right, until the appeal is resolved, and that makes sense. However, there is a rule that says that if the judge orders, she can lift the stay, but then there has to be a hearing within 14 days to determine whether or not that lifting of the stay is permanent. And the judge got to be good at saying, if you appeal, I'm going to lift the stay, right? And then one of, and so that, in my mind, was just a violation of my rights, okay? Because I'm, I'm entitled to appeal. And at that point, it was actually represented by a lawyer who actually said that, but he's entitled to appeal. He has a, a right, right? But the judge had made it very clear that she was gonna go after me for rocking the boat and challenging the system. And I think the guardian had lied to do that. So the guardian had lied and pulled another trump card, which is, she said, uh, Your Honor, I want you to appoint a lawyer for me at the family's expense. And I'm thinking, okay, well, there are a few things going on here. The first is, the guardian ad litem is not a party to the proceeding. She's not allowed to file a motion to have a counsel appointed for her. Another thing that's going on is, even if she were a party to the proceeding and were entitled to file such a motion, I didn't get any notice. It happened in court. She made it live and in person, right? And then I'm thinking, Anne, there's absolutely no legal authority for her to ask the judge to appoint a counsel for her at my expense. And the judge, of course, says, I grant your motion, I appoint, and then named a specific lawyer. And I'm thinking, wow, that's really fascinating, because there's a whole bunch of things that have gone wrong from a legal standpoint here. And who is this specific lawyer? And, and, and why, how does she know he's even available, okay? Some of the answers to those questions came up later, because when I went and looked at this lawyer, it turns out he had been um, named as a defendant in a lot, lot of lawsuits. He had been sued by a lot of his former clients, and one of the lawsuits in which he'd been named a defendant was a suit against the State Grievance Board, where they actually had um, found against him and ordered him to pay $200,000, I think it was, to a client from whom he had essentially defrauded him. By the way, in Connecticut, that's shocking, because in, except for people who like, speak out against the judicial system, Judges, I mean, lawyers, the grievance, the legal grievance system in Connecticut does not work. So the fact that the judge actually managed to find and appoint by name a specific lawyer who had a grievance history is, is fascinating to me. And then I quickly found out that the, the lawyer who'd been appointed to represent my guardian ad litem in my dispute at my expense uh, had one other feature that made him kind of unique in Connecticut. He was arguably the most expensive lawyer in Connecticut. He billed $800 an hour. So at a time, at a time when um, I was a uh, stay-at-home dad, my ex-wife is on, is on disability, um, I'm being required to pay guardian ad litem for $300 an hour, and this lawyer who shows up for her, who uh, then claims that he's entitled to $800 an hour. And I was curious about the fact that the judge appointed the lawyer by name, okay? And the reason for that that when I clerked for the federal judiciary, we had a whole bunch of situations under which a judge is required to recuse the judge from the proceeding. The judge is required to recuse the judge from the proceeding if the judge knows any of the material witnesses. Okay, now that's a huge problem with the way things happen in Connecticut because there are other states that have guardian ad litems. To my knowledge, there are, and they're much more limited. There are caps on their fees. They don't have judicial immunity. They're uh, appointed for specific tasks rather than a, a general objective that's undefined. But in all of these other states, to my knowledge, that appoint guardian ad litems and attorneys for the minor children, the judge cannot pick the individual. And that makes absolute total sense because, again, when I clerked in the federal judiciary, if the judge knew any of the witnesses or any of the parties to the proceeding, the judge would recuse himself. You were required to do that. In Connecticut, it's the exact opposite. In Connecticut, the judges pick these people by name. Now, one of my colleagues who was a, a judge, a family law judge in the Pacific Northwest, um, absolutely refused to believe this was true because in his state, they did have guardian ad litems who could bill, I think, up to $3,000 or something de minimis like that. 
And he said that there they were picked off the list. And if the, when the guardian ad litem's turn came up, if he or she were not available, they would go to the next person on the list. But there was no opportunity for the judge to actually pick their own witness, if you will. Likewise, with respect to lawyers, some of you may be familiar with the United States Supreme Court case of Gideon versus Wainwright, where the United States Supreme Court said in certain circumstances, states have to appoint lawyers for criminal defendants. After that, every state of the union, including Connecticut, created an office of the, of the state's um, the Office of the Legal Defenders. There's some branch of government that's responsible for providing legal defenders for accused criminals. In every single one of those cases, every state, in order to meet constitutional requirements, those offices are distinct from the judicial branch. You cannot have a circumstance where the judge says, okay, the state of Connecticut has to give you a lawyer and I pick you this guy for you. The judge can't pick the lawyer in the proceeding, okay? That has constitutional significance. The judge should recuse him or herself if the lawyer knows the, if, if the judge has any role in the selection of the lawyer, okay? That's the opposite of the way it works in Connecticut. In Connecticut, the judges have complete discretion to do these kinds of things, and they value that because they're rewarding people with the rights to get huge sums of money. Right? The weird thing about being a judge in Connecticut is you might be, forgive me, the least important person of the Judiciary Committee on the legislative branch. You might be the least important bureaucrat. But when you get appointed a family court judge, you go from becoming a person who can't buy a stapler without some supervisor's permission into someone who has the ability to completely raid a family's finances with absolutely no accountability. In, in, in a state, in a state, save the applause for the end, because you're going to slow me down. In a state like Connecticut, where there really are billionaires who live in Greenwich, right? You have these former state bureaucrats who suddenly are a state judge, and they realize they have the keys to the kingdom. They literally control an entire estate, you know, billionaires' entire estate. They can spend as much of it as they want with absolutely no accountability. Back to my divorce. So. Um, the, the short of it was that I filed a motion to remove the guardian ad litem. Like anyone else who's ever done that in Connecticut, I was promptly told I did not have standing to do that. In Connecticut, there's a legal doctrine entirely made up by the, the, the courts, because all of these rules are entirely made up by the courts. It says that a litigant does not have standing to, to even remove his guardian ad litem. That's completely, totally nonsense. Who represents my children? I have a constitutional right to the care, custody, and control of my children. In fact, by the time we get around to this part, it's a post-judgment proceeding. I had sole legal custody of my children. I'm the one who represents the best interest of my children. There's no one else who has any legal right to represent the best interest of my children. I could fire, you know, I can fire the therapist. I can hire a doctor. If I don't like the guy who um, teaches them how to play viola, I can fire that guy too. That's what it means to be a parent, right? So um, my angle on it was, and it, at this point I realized, look, this judge is just out to bankrupt me, right? She's going to literally at $800 an hour. I, I did the math. And, and by the way, the lawyer who was appointed for the guardian ad litem, when he showed up in court, the first thing he did was he filed a motion. And I thought, wow, this is really fascinating. You have a, a, a GAL who can't file a motion, filed a motion for a lawyer. He comes. He can't file a motion because he hasn't, you know, she's not a party to the proceeding. He has no right to speak. He files a motion. Of course, it's an oral motion, so I'm not giving any notice. And his motions were that um, he filed a written motion that I pay a retainer for his fees, that I pay an increased retainer for the guardian ad litem's fees, and that I um, not be allowed to speak to the guardian ad litem except through him. And of course, the judge said, I grant your motion. <laughs> and I'm thinking, this is just absolutely insane. So to step back for a minute, just to make sure you understand the insanity of this, I have my kids 24-7. I have sole legal custody of my children. There is nobody in the universe who knows anything about my kids without me knowing about it. And the, the person who supposedly is responsible for representing their best interests, I can't even speak to her without calling her lawyer. But of course, if you know legal rules, there's, there's a difference, which is I knew that um, I, I had a lawyer at that time, okay, because I went and hired someone and said, listen, this judge is going to run me out to zero. And then, you know, if that happens, maybe at least I'll be able to get out of Connecticut, okay? But instead of just having this, this guardian ad litem and a lawyer take all the cash, I will give you a pile of cash and let's go down fighting. Let's do it that way. So we decided to put up the good fight. And since I had a lawyer, in order for me to contact the guardian ad litem who represented my children before the court with a concern about my children, I had to call my lawyer, right, who's going to charge me several hundred dollars an hour 
who was going to call the guardian ad litem, uh, the lawyer for the guardian ad litem, since the way the legal ethics rules, you know, if someone's represented by a lawyer, when you're a lawyer, you can only speak to them through their lawyer. That makes sense. Uh, and then he, the lawyer for the guardian ad litem, would call the guardian ad litem, and then we would try to time that we were all available, okay? Which wasn't very common because it turns out that the lawyer for the, um, at $800 an hour, you can afford a lot of international travel. So <laughs> it was difficult to find a time that didn't conflict with certain vacation schedules. And I only exercised that right once, and that was when my ex-wife, she had some parenting time with the kids, and she had crashed her car, and all the kids and her were taken to the hospital. And at that point, I was incredibly angry. I was angry at everybody. I was angry at the fake supervisor who was supposed to be making sure she was okay to have the kids. I was angry. You know, I just thought it was worth a few thousand dollars to just yell at someone on the phone for a few minutes. So it took two weeks to arrange the meeting to have that, and uh, I did that. I, I yelled at the, the guy on the phone. And by the way, at this point, I had no... No, there was no chance I was going to pay a lawyer for the guardian ad litem anything. I also wasn't going to pay the guardian ad litem anything because at that point I was basically willing to um, be incarcerated for contempt if I was ordered to do anything nonsensical, and I was just trying to figure out how to, to get my kids into the best place. Okay? Okay, so uh, Manny tells me five minutes. So let me spend my five minutes on, on this. And also, I have a lot of thoughts on psyche vows. My family went through three psyche vows, including two at the same time. Um, as someone who practices special education law, I, I work with psychological evaluations. The psychological evaluations I see in, in what I would call you know, special education law, real law, are completely different than the ones that are used in family law. I have an enormous number of concerns about those. So let me step back and, and, and tell you um, some other things I saw. So when I was on jury duty, I saw three, um, I was on jury duty in Stanford, and basically I skipped out on jury duty. I went and sat in on three family court matters a while ago. And in the first one, there was a dispute where the um, guardian ad litem had not credited the parents with like $10,000 or something. And both of the parents were basically at really mad because the guardian ad litem was being replaced. Um, and the judge basically said, you know, she has absolute immunity, you might as well just pay her. And that was one of those interesting things to me where it's like, wow, the worse you are as a guardian ad litem, the more profitable it is. Because if you just don't credit people for, you know, $10,000 check, you get to build them for straightening out the mess. You get to go to court to, to deal with straightening out the mess. It's just, you know, it, it's a process that encourages malfeasance. And the second matter involved some mom who was, had been un, under supervised visitation for an entire year, okay? Um, and the, the, both the mother, the, the guardian ad litem and some court-appointed therapist were yelling at each other in court to blame the fact that no, everyone agreed this mom didn't have to be supervised. Um, but and, and there was just no way to eliminate it in short. So people were arguing about that. In the third matter, which was particularly interesting, a attorney for the minor children, or more accurately, an attorney representing the attorney for the minor children, was collecting on an a, attorney for the minor children bill that was three hundred and eighty-two thousand dollars. That was just the unpaid portion of the attorney for the minor children's uh, bill, and she had managed to get a lien against uh, one of the family's homes to secure her supposed unpaid bill, and she was asking the judge to execute on the lien and, um, to, to quote her um, motion, to have the mother incarcerated until such time as the mother closes the signs, the, the documents that allow the, the, court, the, the house to be transferred so it could be sold to satisfy the unpaid bill for the attorney for the minor children. So at this point, I do the economist thing. I step back and say, okay, what's really going on here? What are the incentives in the system that are leading to these kinds of outcomes? And I, when I identify the different parties in the system, I think first you have parents. And I decided to assume that the parents were going to act in the best interest of kids. <coughs> Interestingly, that's exactly the opposite. Uh, that's con completely consistent with the US Constitution. It's the opposite of the way the family court system works in Connecticut. In Connecticut, there's a legal doctrine that basically assumes that parents who are involved in family court proceedings are incapable. They're so emotional and caught up in their own needs, they're incapable of representing the best interests of their children. Therefore, there effectively has to be a guardian ad litem. That's crazy. But I assume the parents were going to do the best thing for their kids or their family as they broadly defined it. Okay. The second person was the the lawyers. That's easy. They're for profit, you know, profit maximizing individuals. They're out to make a living. Uh, and then the third group of people were all these people who are supposedly represent, appointed to represent kids. And there's a huge variety of them. Guardian ad litems, attorneys for the minor children, custody evaluators, custody dispute resolution people, mediators, supervisors. You know, there's, there's more. The, the judges can make up whatever court appointees they want, so there's no limit on those, right? And I decided that they were in it 
to make a living, that basically they were going to do what was economically rational. Those people have absolute immunity in Connecticut. That's different than other states. Um, so they cannot be sued. Now, when you give people an incentive to engage in malfeasance, a huge financial incentive, they're not subject to a budget constraint, uh, they have no uh, liability, they're going to engage in a lot of malfeasance. And that's what's happening. And then the third, uh, they're the last group of individuals I had to try and figure out what were their incentives, were the judges. And I'm like, okay, what do the judges care about? What's going on? It was clear to me they didn't care about the law, they didn't care about the Constitution, and they didn't care about my kids. But what is, is the motivation of a judge who, who engages in this kind of behavior? And the short of it is, I think that what the judges care about, who viewed most favorably to the judges, is they don't want to make a bad decision. Okay? I've never been a director of a, of a public company, but I've been a director of a lot of private companies. And when you're a director of a company, you have to make a decision on behalf of the company. You have to decide something. And the way you make sure that your decision can't be challenged or it's legally valid is you go through a process. And the process involves consulting with a lot of outside people. In contrast, so I'll finish in just a couple, that's okay. In contrast, um, in, in, so in order to, basically the judges have an incentive to bring all of these people into their into your uh, litigation in order to have the judge be held responsible for making a bad decision. But there's something, and they're not subject to any kind of budget constraint. They're spending your money, right? If the judges had to pay for all these people, this would all end tomorrow. Um, yeah. it, 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 there's another thing going on. The judges have a huge incentive to not make a decision at all, right? And you see that in family court all of the time. The, the whole thing is designed so that you cannot get your matter resolved. Everybody's supposed to be there on the same open calendar day, but their judges aren't available. You file a motion, it's, it shows up at some random time on the short calendar, you have to mark it ready, you go to court, you're not going to be heard that day, right? This process is designed to tax and punish litigants to get them out of the system without the judge making a decision. The judges are like the guardian ad litem. They have immunity. They're not subject to any oversight. They're not subject to any discipline. You know, the, the, there is a disciplinary board for judges in this state, but they've never ever held a judge accountable. Most of the time, if you file a grievance against a judge, what will happen is that it will be found not to have probable cause, and it doesn't make a difference what's in your grievance. Okay, that system uh, doesn't work. Thank you.